Welcome to the Labor and Delivery Lecture. During this lecture, we'll be talking about the physiological aspects of labor and delivery, nursing support of the patient going through labor and delivery, pain management techniques, and electronic fetal monitoring. Let's get started. We have some critical factors in labor that allow us to go from a woman being pregnant to a woman with a newborn. They are the birth passage or the passageway. So this is the baby moving from the uterus through the cervix into the vagina and then being born. The fetus, of course, we can't forget the baby. This is the passenger, the one who is taking the passage trip <laughs> from the uterus out into the world. Then there's re the relationship between the passage and the fetus. So this is the proportion. This is where we can sometimes run into problems. Maybe the baby is too big for the mom's pelvis, and we'll be talking about that later. So we do need to consider the proportion, the relationship between the passage and the fetus. Often this is size or the baby's position. Physiological forces also impact labor. These are the powers. This might be uterine contractions and psychological factors, the psyche generally of the mother. Several factors affect labor as it pertains to the passenger, the fetus in this case. One is fetal presentation. How is the fetus presenting? Is it head first, butt first, shoulder first? Another is fetal attitude. How well flexed or extended is the baby's body? Of course, ideally, the baby is going to be well flexed. And then the size of the fetal head. Fetal presentation, what is the presenting part? What do we expect to see as the mother delivers the fetus? Or what if we're doing an exam, do we expect to feel if we're doing a manual exam? Most common and what we hope to see is cephalic presentation, the head being first. Another option is breech, this is the baby's bottom or butt first. And finally, a shoulder presentation. We can feel the shoulder. Nowadays, breech and shoulder presentations are an indication for C-section. Once we know that a baby is cephalic or head first, we still need to determine the type of cephalic presentation. Figure A refers to a vertex or occiput presentation. The occiput, the crown of the head, is the presenting part. This is the type of cephalic presentation that we see most commonly and that we want to see. Um, the fetal head is completely flexed and the chin is to the chest, as you can see there. So that allows for the smallest diameter of the fetal head to be being birthed. So this is ideal and you don't need to know um, the different centimeters and so on on here for testing purposes. Figure B is the sinusput presentation. This is kind of in between cephalic and a brow presentation. So the head is kind of partially flexed here. But a brow presentation is where the baby's head is beginning to lift up. The brow or the forehead is the presenting part. So you can see here that kind of a very large aspect of the head is what's presenting. So this is not an ideal situation. In figure D, you see a facial presentation. So this, in this situation, the fetal head is hyperextended or completely extended, and these babies can come out with very bruised faces. Again, vertex presentation, figure A, is most ideal, where the crown is the presenting part. Here we have some pictures of different types of fetal presentation. So what is presenting first? We've established that we want the baby to be vertical or vertex with a vertical lie being up and down longitudinally within the mother's abdomen inside of the uterus. We've also established that we want the baby to be in a vertex position, occiput first. So we want the crown of the head to be the presenting part because that allows for the smallest diameter and we want the baby to be in a well flexed attitude. We want the baby to be flexed, chin to the chest. What's the most common presentation? Most commonly, we see right occiput anterior. What does this mean? This means that the presenting part, the occiput, the crown of the baby's head, is to the right of the mother's pelvis, and it's anterior, so it's to the right and forward 
of the mother's pelvis. This means that when the baby delivers, we're going to be seeing the back of the baby's head. The baby is going to be facing down upon delivery. Don't get confused about this. This is in relation to the presenting part, not which way the baby is facing, not which way the baby's face is facing. So if you see a delivery, the baby's head presents on top or anterior, you see the back of the baby's head, but the baby is facing down. That's not posterior. It's not in relation to where the baby's face is facing. It's in relationship to where the presenting part is facing. So in an occiput presenting part, it's in relation to where that occiput is. And most commonly, like I said, ROA, right occiput anterior, is most common. So what happens if the baby comes out, and we will lovingly call this sunny side up. The baby comes out, delivers, and you see the face as the mother is delivering after the hair comes out. You see the face anterior. The face is facing up toward the ceiling. This is called posterior presentation. This can be difficult. Posterior presentation can make for a long labor, and it can be painful as the baby's head is in the wrong direction or a different position than we typically see or that we would like to ideally see. So we can have her change position frequently, assume a hands and knees position, roll her side to side. Those are the things that we can do for a posterior presentation. So ideally, we'd like to see occiput anterior, right occiput anterior is the most common. Also on this picture, you will see some diagrams as you get to the bottom of breech presentations. Again, not ideal, um, often nowadays an indication for a C-section delivery. But these are the different presentations and, and what they can be as far as a longitudinal lie. These are some pictures of looking at the brow and facial presentation from the birthing perspective. Again, these are not the ideal types of cephalic presentations. We're hoping to see vertex presentation where the crown is the presenting part and the baby's head is well flexed, chin to the chest. The brow presentation, what do we see coming out or what are we feeling as we do an exam? We would be feeling the forehead as the presenting part. Certainly, this would be a much wider um, way of delivery. We have a wider part of the head trying to be delivered, and you can see that it doesn't fit as well on the pelvis. The facial presentation, the face is what's coming out first, so you're not seeing the baby's head as she delivers, the back of the head and the hair, you're seeing the face. When the fetal head is not the presenting part, it can be a breech presentation. Diagram A refers to frank breach. So this would be where the buttocks are first. If we do an exam and try to see what the presenting part is, we're not going to feel a, a head with fontanelles. We're going to feel the buttocks of the baby. Another breech presentation is B. This is a footling breech. So the baby's feet are not up onto the body, but one of the feet or both of the feet are the presenting part. So here we see frank breech in A, and then in figure B, footling breech. Um, nowadays, breech presentations are generally C-section deliveries for our purposes. Here we have a shoulder presentation. So this is not breech. The butt or legs are not first, and it's not cephalic. The head is not first. This is a transverse lie. The baby's lying across the mother's abdomen rather than a longitudinal lie where the baby is up and down. In a longitudinal lie, they could be a cephalic presentation, being the head presenting the part, or they can be a breech presentation, the butt or legs being the presenting part. But when there's a shoulder presentation, we go to examine the patient to see what the presenting part is. There's a shoulder there. This is a transverse lie. The baby is lying across the mother's abdomen rather than up and down. Fetal attitude has to do with the relationship of body parts of the fetus. Which one is ideal? Do we want to see the body flexed? Or do we want to see that the extremities are extended? In figure A, the extremities are flexed, and this is what we hope to see for delivery. In figure B, we see that the extremities are extended. So this could lead for a difficult delivery. So fetal attitude is the relationship of the fetal parts to each other. We're hoping to see that the baby is very flexed like figure A. The fetal head has three major parts, the face, the bones here,
ear are well fused together. The base of the skull, where the two temporal bones are well fused, and then the vault. This is not well fused. This is held together by sutures. Sutures are membranous spaces between the cranial bones. And there are fontanelles, intersections of cranial sutures, that can mold. What's the purpose of all of this? Well, there are a couple of purposes. One is during the delivery process of a vaginal delivery, the sutures can kind of override themselves to make the head a little bit smaller for the birthing process. Secondly, as the developing human and child, as the brain grows, these allow for the skull to also grow with it. If these were perfectly fused, it would be difficult to deliver the baby. In addition, it would leave little room for brain development. So we have an anterior diamond-shaped fontanelle and a posterior triangularly shaped fontanelle. The anterior fontanelle is open for a longer period of time than the posterior one is. There are also some critical factors that have to do with the passageway. The birth passage, the size of the maternal pelvis. If we have a small pelvis and a big baby, there might not be a match. So it's important to see the size of the maternal pelvis, the pelvic inlet and outlet, to see that the baby is going to get, be able to get through the pelvis. And there are some different types of pelvises. Gynecoid, as the name suggests, is most ideal. There's android, arthropod, and platypoid, too. Another factor that has to do with the passageway is the ability of the cervix to dilate or open up and also the ability of the cervix to efface or become thin. Two of the things that we measure to quantify what's going on with labor, how much progress is happening, are cervical effacement and dilation. The cervix is the opening to the uterus at the top of the vagina. Effacement, if you look at this diagram and kind of look at the top portion first, effacement is the gradual thinning and shortening of the cervix. So you can see here in the first figure with the baby's head on the cervix, it is pretty thick. This is 0% effaced. As labor progresses, we see 100% effacement. It will actually become paper thin. So we measure effacement or the thinning of the cervix in terms of 0 to 100% eff effaced. Dilation is the opening of the cervix. So we have effacement going on, thinning, and we also have the cervix opening from zero or closed all the way to 10 centimeters. And that would be what we would expect a term neonate to need. We measure this generally digitally with a two finger exam and we all kind of get used to what one centimeter or four centimeters or 10 centimeters feels like to us. But we have effacement and dilation happening simultaneously. I love to use the analogy of a lifesaver. If you put a lifesaver in your mouth without biting it and wait for it to melt, you'll see that that center hole is opening up and the whole thing becomes thinner at the same time. That's what's happening to the cervix. Typically, the cervix is effacing and becoming thin and also dilating at the same time. So a couple of things are happening to the cervix. One of them is dilatation or dilating, opening up. The cervix is opening to allow for delivery from closed or one centimeter open to 10 centimeters open. And we assess this typically with a manual exam. The cervix opens, this is caused by fetal axis pressure. So as the uterus contracts, it pushes the fetus down. That puts pressure on the cervix, the opening to the uterus from the vagina. And that allows the cervix to be drawn up. So when she is complete, complete means 10 centimeters dilated, completely dilated. We are unable to feel any cervix during the manual exam. As I've said, effacement is thinning of the cervix, the opening from the vagina to the uterus. The thinning of the cervix is expressed as a percentage. So how do we know how thin or how thick the cervix is? 0% effaced would be a thick cervix as in somebody who's never had a baby or isn't in labor. 100% effaced is a paper-thin cervix. Somebody who's 100% effaced typically would be uh, at, toward the end of labor 
and getting ready to um, have a baby. Very thin cervix, paper thin. I'm trying to explain this and show you in a few different ways what's happening here as, for, as far as dilatation and effacement are concerned so that you really understand it. Effacement, again, is the thinning of the cervix. So it goes from being thick, like diagram A, to being very, very paper thin. You can see it becoming thinner than it is in A, in diagram B, even thinner yet in diagram C, and in diagram D, she is completely effaced, 100% effaced and dilated. Dilatation and effacement typically happen simultaneously. So with contractions, each contraction, the uterus contracts, that pushes the baby's head down against the cervix. With that, we have thinning of the cervix, which is effacement, effacement, and also opening or dilatation of the cervix. So you can see that these are kind of happening simultaneously. A, the cervix is thick and closed. B, it's thinning out a little bit. C, it's beginning to dilate or open up and thin. And D, it's completely opened, completely dilated, and 100% effaced. So when a patient is complete and ready to push, she is 10 centimeters dilated and 100% effaced. Upon manual exam, we would feel no cervix. We'd only feel the baby's head. When considering the relationship of the presenting part to the pelvis, we can look at engagement. Engagement refers to the largest diameter of the presenting part passing through the pelvic inlet. This is the head, this would be the biparietal diameter. We can also look at the station. This is the relationship of the presenting part to the ischial spines, and this is one of the things that we assess oftentimes when we're assessing um, how far dilated and how far effaced a patient is that we'll continue on with in a few slides. Along with measuring and quantifying dilation and effacement, or you might hear dilatation, you'll see it uh, worded both ways, just for clarification. Along with measuring dilatation and effacement, we're going to look at station. What is station? Station is how high up or how far down low the baby is. So how close is the baby to coming out? Is it still high up in this diagram, minus five station? Or is the baby plus five? That would be nearly delivering, starting to come out. The baby is at zero station when it is at the ischial spines. So zero station is at the ischial spines. Once the baby begins to come through zero station, plus one, plus two, plus three, plus four, plus five, the baby is then delivering. Minus negative stations indicate that the baby is higher up still within the mom's abdomen. Putting dilatation, effacement, and station together. When we do a vaginal exam, we assess for cervical dilatation, effacement, and station simultaneously. So you can see here, and you won't be expected to do this in your clinical setting, but you certainly will observe this. And this is one of the expectations of RNs working in the labor and delivery unit. So here, like I said, it's a two-finger digital exam. We can assess how dilated is this cervix how effaced or how thin is it, and where is the baby's head in relation to the mother's ischial spines. There are two forces of labor that allow a fetus to be born and become a newborn. These are the contractions, the tightening of the uterine muscle. We consider intensity, or the strength of the contraction, the frequency, that is, from the start of one contraction to the start of the next, how frequent are the contractions? And the duration, how long the contractions last. And we measure this from the start of the contraction to the end of the contraction. Another force of labor is pushing. So with the muscles, the abdominal muscles, the mother pushes once she is completely effaced and dilated. Premonitory signs of labor are impending labor. Some of the signs include lightning. What's lightning? That is where the baby drops, you might hear some women say. The baby seems to settle into the pelvic inlet. This is called engagement. When this happens, um, mothers can sometimes feel that the baby is lower. They can have increased urinary frequency. 
um, some increased venous stasis leading to edema, and a, a lot more pelvic pressure associated with this. But they can say that the baby has dropped. They feel like they can breathe a little bit easier. This can be a premonitory sign of labor. Also, an increase in frequency and duration of contractions, especially if they've been having Braxton Hicks contractions, they might notice these picking up. Vaginal bleeding, a little bit of a bloody show or mucus plug can be released as a sign of impending labor. The mucus plug can be released. That was there um, in the cervix. And as the cervix begins to soften a little bit, that barrier, the mucus plug, can be released. And they can see some um, pink-tinged secretions called a bloody show in association with that. The cervix can become ripened or softened in preparation for labor. Also, she can note some back pain, and some of this can be due to the hormone relaxin and its effects on the pelvic joints. A big one that people often think of as a premonitory sign of labor is spontaneous rupture of membranes. This happens in about 12% of women. Their water breaks or spontaneous rupture of membranes. Um, so we can also see this as a premonitory sign of labor, and about 80% of women will experience spontaneous labor within 24 hours of their water breaking. Also, nesting, um, you may have heard about. This is a sudden burst of energy that some women get. All of a sudden, they want to, you know, clean the house and clean the... Uh, the tub and the toilet with a toothbrush kind of thing, nesting behaviors. They, you know, suddenly get the urge to do a lot of things. Let's do all the laundry. Let's reorganize. These are nesting behaviors and can be seen also as premonitory signs of labor. So a woman presents to labor and delivery and believes her water has broken. How do we confirm there's been rupture of membranes? You know, we've talked a lot about the pressure on the bladder from the pregnancy. It wouldn't be unusual for her to have some leaking of urine or maybe some vaginal secretions. What we would expect them to do during a speculum exam is obtain some of the fluid, and we can confirm positive rupture of membranes, ruling out urine or vaginal secretions in a couple of ways. One of them is ferning. So we would get some of the fluid and put it on the slide, let it dry, and they look at it under, under a microscope. Amniotic fluid, when it dries, ferns, like the picture on the slide. It kind of has a fern pattern to it. You may also see the use of nitrazine paper or an amnio indicator. Both of them are yellow. Nitrazine paper is just that. It's paper. An amnio indicator looks like a Q-tip, yellow on the end. When nitrazine paper or an amnio indicator are exposed to amniotic fluid, they will turn that dark blue or black in color. With these, we can confirm positive rupture of membranes, ruling out urine or some other vaginal secretions. So a patient calls and asks, how do I know if I'm in labor? True labor versus false labor. True labor is regular contractions that increase in frequency, duration, and strength. So they're increasing in how frequently they're occurring, their duration, how long they are, and their strength. They're becoming stronger. They also, here's, here's a key, they lead to progressive dilatation and effacement of the cervix. So that is key with labor, is what is, what is the definition of labor? Labor is contractions leading to dilatation and effacement. So that is key in determining true labor versus false labor. Also, when you ask the patient about the pain, oftentimes they'll say that the discomfort starts in their back and radiates around their body. False labor, on the other hand, often irregular contractions. They don't really increase in frequency, duration, or strength. They're very irregular. Some are kind of stronger than others, but there's no real pattern of getting stronger here. If we do a vaginal exam, they do not lead to dilatation and effacements. The patient will not have a changed exam. And if you ask the patient how they feel, oftentimes they'll kind of say, it feels like my abdomen's turning into a ball, or it's a hardening sensation, not really a true discomfort. But again, the, the uh, key piece here is the progressive dilatation and effacement does not exist in true labor versus false labor. If a patient calls or comes in, 
And she is in false labor. We do want to reassure her that she did the right thing. Certainly making sure that everything is okay um, is a good thing. And sometimes it's very difficult to determine uh, which it is without doing a vaginal exam because we need to check on the dilatation and effacement. So we certainly want to reassure her. And um, if she isn't sure, have her come in for an exam. It is important to point out one commonly used medication in labor and delivery. This is Pitocin. Pitocin is a chemically made manufactured version of the body's natural oxytocin. So it is used to help hasten contractions, to augment labor or induce labor. Augment means to add to it, induce means to start it. We'll be talking about those um, issues within the high-risk labor and delivery. However, you will see Pitocin used on many, many labors, even on women who are healthy. It's also used after the delivery process to promote increased uterine tone after delivery to help tone up that uterus to help prevent some bleeding as well. What are some maternal responses to labor? All these I think you'll find pretty intuitive. As far as cardiovascular system goes, there's an increase in cardiac output. She is working hard. In addition, she's still supporting this pregnancy through the labor. We'll also see an increased blood pressure during contractions. Again, her body is working, there's pain associated with this, so you may see an increased blood pressure with contractions. As far as fluid and electrolytes are concerned, she has diaphoresis. She might be having some hyperventilation with pain, especially if she's pushing and in between, she might be hyperventilating in between pushes. She may have a slightly elevated temp due to muscle activity also. Respiratory system follows suit. There's an increased demand for oxygen, so there may be some mild metabolic acidosis that'll be compensated by respiratory alkalosis. Other maternal responses affect the renal system, GI system, and immune system. As far as the renal system is concerned, there's an increase in renin and angiotensin, and this is to help control uterine blood flow. Also, the bladder is pushed forward and upward because of the anatomy. What's going on with the uterus pushes the bladder forward and upward. The GI system, gastric motility is reduced, gastric emptying time is prolonged, and there's increased acidity of gastric contents. Right now, the GI system isn't the priority, so you have things slowing down there. And as far as the immune system is concerned, often we see increased white blood cells, 25,000 to 30,000, due to stress and decreased blood glucose levels. A birth plan is really helpful. It communicates between staff and patients what it is that the patient would like to see in her ideal birthing experience. So can we always, does everything always go according to plan? Certainly not, but this gives us a good idea of what the patient has in mind, what she'd like, and uh, what she doesn't like. So her, the type of care provider that she would like, what kind of birth setting she would like to have, um, during labor, what kinds of things she would like? Would she like to ambulate? Does she want to shower? Does she want to wear her own clothes? Does she want to use a, a rocking chair? Um, these kind of things. How does she feel about a monitor? Many hospitals, especially locally here where you'll be, will have um, a fetal monitor on for the vast majority of the time. If a patient's stable, you may see some intermittent monitoring where we go with a Doppler every few minutes, and as long as everything looks okay, if she wants to be in the tub or something, um, they may proceed with that with an order to do so. Membranes, how does she feel about having her membranes artificially ruptured if need be? labor stimulation or use of Pitocin. What are her thoughts on that? What kinds of medications um, is she open to? How does she feel about fluids or ice, music, massage, touch? All of these kinds of things. What positions is she comfortable with for birthing? We know that the best position for having a baby is not lithotomy, the patient kind of laying back with the legs open, even though that's what we'll see the, the vast majority of the time. However, for better or worse, in our country, particularly this region, um, it's become the accepted position of having a baby. But uh, for gravity and a variety of other reasons, it is not the most ideal position. 
What family does she want present? How does she feel about filming at birth or photography at birth? And many institutions have um, policies about filming and photography for liability reasons. What are her thoughts on the possibility of an episiotomy? What does she want to do immediately after birth as far as holding the baby or breastfeeding? How does she feel about separation after birth? Does she want to save the placenta? Is she planning to collect cord blood for banking? And what about newborn care? How does she feel there in her postpartum stay? So a birth plan is a great way, first of all, for patients to think about what they want the, their experience to look like and maybe consider things that they've never thought about. And it's a great way for them to communicate those to us as providers and for providers to communicate these things amongst ourselves. Now, will everything always turn out perfectly to the birth plan? No, but it gives us a really good starting place. She does not need to be bound to the birth plan either. This is just kind of a guide, a place for us to start in our care for her. Typically, patients do these at home prior to coming in. There are several stages of labor and birth we'll be discussing, and we'll give details of each of these on the slides to come. Of course, there is the first stage. This is comprised of 0 to 10 centimeters dilated. The second stage is from 10 centimeters dilated, so completely dilated, to delivery of the baby. This is the exciting stage. <laughs> the third stage is the expulsion and delivery of the placenta. And the fourth stage is the first few hours postpartum when they are recovering and baby is transitioning. Labor is broken up into several stages. Within the first stage of labor, there are also several phases. The first stage of labor goes from the cervix being zero centimeters dilated to complete or 10 centimeters dilated. So the first stage of labor is the dilation of the cervix. It does not include the delivery of the baby or the fetus. So note the first stage of labor goes from zero centimeters dilated to completely dilated, which is 10 centimeters. The first stage of labor is composed of three phases, the early or latent phase, the active phase, and the transitional phase. The early or latent phase of labor within the first stage of labor starts with the onset of contractions. Typically, contractions are very mild during the early phase of labor. The woman is typically very able to cope with her pain, and she's excited. You might hear her say, oh, I've been so ready for this. I can't believe this day is here. So she's excited. She may also be anxious about what's coming ahead, but she's able to verbalize that anxiety in a way that's coherent. So typically, she's very cooperative. Um, she's able to cope with her pain and mild contractions during the earlier latent phase of the first stage of labor. After the earlier latent phase comes the active phase. Here, contractions intensify. They were more mild in the latent or early phase. They're becoming more intense in the active phase. Also, the mother can become much more anxious. She's typically four to seven centimeters dilated, and the fetus is becoming to come down. So we should be seeing the station move down. The typical pattern for cervical dilation here, um, for nulliparous women, these are women who have never had a baby before, we expect them to progress at about 1.2 centimeters per hour. Now again, we do not have a crystal ball. I'd be a rich woman if I could determine exactly how long it would take somebody to deliver, but this is just kind of the, the average. And for a multiparous woman, a woman who's had children before, we'd expect her cervix to change at about 1.5 centimeters per hour during the active phase of the first stage of labor. The transition phase is the last phase in the first stage of labor. This is typically when a woman progresses from 8 to 10 centimeters dilation. During this time, she has increasing um, intensity of her contractions and very significant anxiety. She dilates, like I said, from 8 to 10 centimeters, but dilation slows and the descent of the fetus increases. So dilation is slowing, but the baby is coming down, as far as the station is concerned, um, is coming down during the transitional phase. Most acutely, what you'll notice when you're caring for a patient in transitional phase is their behavior changes. They may start hyperventilating, being very uh, restless, 
difficulty, they may have difficulty following commands, or uh, somebody who was very sweet early on in labor, talking about her nursery and so on, all of a sudden starts swearing at her husband. They might uh, start swearing or stating that they just can't take it anymore and yelling. During this time, it's really helpful if we can help her you know, give her support through this. Help her regain a focus is what's really important. You can say, look at me. We can do this. Breathe with me and kind of get very close to her face. Don't leave her during this period of time. Stay with her. Support her. Do what it is that's helpful to her. How long does this last? It doesn't sound like fun, does it? But the prize is on the way. <laughs> the baby's on the way. For um, the Lipera, somebody who has never had a baby before, we would expect the transition phase to last less than three hours. For a Multipera, we would expect it to last less than one hour. Again, there's no crystal ball, um, but, but looking at the literature, this is the time frame that we would expect to see for the transition phase, the last phase of the first stage of labor. The second stage of labor encompasses the time from when the woman is 10 centimeters dilated or complete up to and including delivery. During this time, we'll encourage her to push when she feels that she has the urge to push. This is when she would bear down. Sometimes we'll tell women to bear down as though they're having a bowel movement. Obviously, they're not having a bowel movement, they're having a baby, but it does kind of help train them or help them help coach them how to push. Using a mirror can be effective if a woman is comfortable with that to see what's working. Sometimes she, if she can see the baby coming out just a little bit with each push, that can be really encouraging to her. Also, um, counting is a technique um, some women um, respond well to, and we really encourage open glottis pushing. So rather than to hold their breath and push, we tell them to have open glottis pushing. How long does this last? Again, another crystal ball question. For nulliparas, women who have not had babies, typically somewhere around two hours. And for multiparous women, women who have had babies in the, in the past, typically somewhere around 15 minutes. But there is no exact rule of thumb. You may see women in both cases lasting longer or shorter than this. But we really do need to support patients, especially as the baby is crowning. It can be um, kind of painful. And you'll hear them say that it feels like the ring of fire as the baby is crowning or, or beginning to, to really um, plunge out as it's beginning to deliver. So we tell them to push through that pain. Um, that can really be effective. Being a coach to parents who are going through pushing is very rewarding. It's certainly a time when we can offer a lot of support. Ultimately, she has to do the work, but we can certainly provide her reassurance and support to get her through this. Telling her that she's doing a great job, telling her when she pushes and we can start to see, you know, the baby's hair, the baby come out a little bit, telling her, you know, that's the one, that's the way. You may see nurses counting with patients, counting to 10. Um, to, to have them have a more prolonged push. You may also see um, people using a birthing bar so that they aren't pushing in a lithotomy position, but they're kind of squatting, holding on to a birthing bar that's attached to the bed to push. Um, or also pooling. You knot up a um, towel or a blanket, and you kind of play tug-of-war, if you remember when you were in grade school. She holds one end, you hold the other, and she'll pull on that. And from pulling on that, it will cause her body to actually push. You also notice in patients who are vomiting or coughing, sometimes that does bring the baby down, so that's not all that unusual. You'll hear us, um, as she pushes and the baby is coming down, say that she is crowning. What does crowning mean? Crowning means that birth is imminent. So the baby's head will be almost encircled in the perineal tissue um, of the mother's. Again, she'll feel some acute, increasingly severe pain and burning as the perineum distends during this time. You may see the provider use mineral oil or do a perineal massage to try to uh, loosen the tissue and this sensation for the mother during this time. But birth is imminent when the baby's head is crowning. There are several positional changes that the fetus goes through as it passes through the birth canal. We call these cardinal movements. The first of these is descent. Descent, as the name indicates, 
is when the head enters the inlet. And there are four causes for this. One of them is pressure from the amniotic fluid. So toward the end of the pregnancy, there's quite a bit of pressure, and the amniotic fluid is one of those pressures. Another is pressure from the uterus, specifically if the baby is in a vertex position, head down, pressure that is on uh, the baby's rear. Contractions of the abdominal muscles are another sort of pressure that lead the baby to descend into the inlet. And then also, as the baby extends its body, this will cause it to descend into the inlet. This is the cardinal movement of descent. The next in the cardinal movements is flexion. So what do we see here? The chin is flexing toward the chest because as the baby is moving down, it's meeting resistance from the soft tissues in the pelvis. So it flexes. It flexes its chin to its chest. Next in the cardinal movements is internal rotation. As the head meets resistance from the levator ani mus muscles and the fascia, the occiput rotates from left to right, the crown of the head that is, rotates from left to right in order to fit the diameter of the pelvic cavity. Continuing to move through the cardinal movements, extension, as the name indicates, is when the fetal head extends as it passes under the symphysis pubis. It does this because it meets resistance of the, of the pelvic floor and the opening of the vulva. During the cardinal movement of restitution, the head emerges and turns to one side. It basically untwists. The neck became twisted through the process of the shoulders entering the pelvis, so now it's turning its head to one side and aligning its position to the position of the back. External rotation is happening as the head is delivered. The head turns even farther to one side, and this is because the shoulders of the baby still inside the mother are rotating to the anterior posterior position, so the baby turns its head far to one side of the pelvis. Expulsion is the final cardinal movement that results in the anterior shoulder being born, followed by the posterior shoulder, and the body quickly follows. What's happening here is the anterior shoulder moves under the symphysis pubis, and flexion of the shoulder and head occur. Like I said, in the end, the anterior shoulder, shoulder is born, followed by the posterior shoulder, and the baby's body quickly follows. The moment is here. What happens during delivery? The head distends down with each contraction. As there's extension under the mom's symphysis pubis, this leads to the delivery of the head. Then you'll hear the provider say, I need a little push. Here we're going to de deliver the shoulders, and then it's quickly followed by the birth of the body. During the labor and delivery process, some women will have a perineal laceration. This is where the tissue between the vagina and most of the time toward the rectal anal area tears a little bit to allow greater opening for the delivery. Now, some people talk about lacerations versus episiotomies, so I'll talk about the pros and cons of each on, on this slide and on the next. The pro of a laceration, the positive of a laceration, is that the tissue can tear where it is the weakest. The con, however, is that it may be difficult to repair if it's jagged. In addition, it can extend to become a fourth degree laceration. This is where the tissue between the vagina and rectal anal area tears completely. In addition, since it's not a controlled tear, it can tear into the labia or up toward the urethra. Some things that you'll see providers do to try to prevent a laceration or episiotomy is a perineal massage. You'll kind of see them scooping the perineal tissue to kind of stretch it out to allow for delivery. And you may see them also use mineral oil as a lubricant. An episiotomy is when the provider lengthens the vaginal opening to allow for delivery by cutting some of the tissue. As you can see here on the diagram, you can see the baby's head crowning. That tissue is really stretching, and sometimes the tissue can hold the baby back a little bit. Or if we allow the baby to deliver, we could risk a fourth degree laceration. So the pro to the episiotomy is that it's controlled. So we don't risk her tearing into the rectum quite as much or tearing up into the urethra or the labia. So it's more controlled. Therefore, the repair is cleaner. So we might have less chance for infection also. A con, however, is, though, is that it might not be necessary. Perhaps 
if we let things go naturally, she might not have needed it. Generally, providers are pretty cautious and conservative when it comes to episiotomies. They don't do it unless they feel that they need to to allow more space for the baby or that a laceration, uh, the cons of a laceration could outweigh those of the episiotomy. During the third stage of labor, the placenta is delivered. Placental separation from the uterine wall begins as the uterus starts to firm up and there's a decreased surface area, so the placenta will begin separating. The delivery of the placenta takes place when the, when the placenta separates from the uterine wall. You may see the provider guiding it using the cord. Please note that we do not pull on the cord. We don't want to pull the placenta off prematurely or have any retained placental parts in there at all. So this is merely a way of guiding the placenta out. We may ask the mother to bear down during this, but certainly this is not pushing um, like when she was in labor at all. A retained placenta is present if the placenta is not delivered within 30 minutes following the delivery of the baby. Typically, though, the placenta delivers within just a few minutes. The provider will then inspect the placenta to see that it's all there, that there's no retained placental parts. This visual goes along with the last slide, stage three of labor, delivery of the placenta. Here, what you can see is, in, in figure A, is that the uterus is now getting smaller. So there's decreased surface area for that placenta to be attached to the uterine wall with. That and some hormonal changes obviously allow for the separation and expulsion of the placenta. The cord, if you note, is hanging out of the vagina. The baby was delivered with the cord. The cord was cut. The rest of the cord remains attached to the placenta. So that's what you see there. The placenta is then expulsed, and um, again, the provider checks to be sure that, that it is intact. During the fourth stage of labor, the first one to four hours following delivery, we have exci some exciting things going on. If the mom is okay, let's assume that, this is prime time for bonding and breastfeeding. We like to get breastfeeding established within the first hour following delivery. So the bonding here is critical, and typically the baby is in a quiet, active, alert stage, which we'll talk about when we uh, discuss the newborn further on. As far as the mom's physiological status goes, we see a drop in blood pressure. What do you think happens with that? There is an increase in pulse that goes along with that. Why does she have a drop in her BP and an increase in pulse? Because she has lost blood, presumably during the delivery. What are we going to be assessing here? We'll be assessing her bleeding. We're also going to be assessing her fundal location. If you'll remember, the fundus is the top of the uterus. So when, if she was term, it would have been just under her breast there at her rib cage. After delivery, we expect it to be firm, to be putting pressure on the site where the placenta let go, kind of like we would put pressure on a wound. We want the uterine muscle to be firm, putting pressure on the site where the placenta let go to help decrease any bleeding that might come from that. So we're going to assess that it's firm, and then we're going to assess its location. It should be somewhere in between the umbilicus, the belly button, and the symphysis pubis. So we will be measuring that in finger breaths above or below the umbilicus, and we'll talk about this further in the postpartum module. Also during the fourth stage, the mom may be shaking, and they, they really do shake like they're cold. It's almost a shivering. They're not cold. You can get some warm blankets, and that may help um, alleviate some of the shaking sensation, but a lot of it is just due to the uh, stress unfolding from the delivery and the physiological stresses that happened and her body just kind of adapting to that. Also, she may have a hypotonic bladder, and if a patient has a hypotonic bladder, there's lack of tone, it can really fill up. So we want to make sure that she doesn't have an over-distended bladder during this fourth stage of, of um, labor and delivery. Pain management is an important role of the labor and delivery nurse. Different people have different perceptions of pain, different expectations of pain, and different tolerances of pain. Pain is our fifth vital sign, so it's difficult to have a conversation about labor and delivery without discussing pain. If you look at the diagram below, the areas that are in darker pink 
are the areas where a woman will typically experience more pain during the first stage of labor. The first stage, again, encompasses earlier latent phase, it encompasses the active phase, and it encompasses the transitional phase. So where is she feeling the pain? She's feeling the pain with contractions, it looks like, and she can be having some back pain, too, particularly if the baby is occiput posterior, the baby's crown is in her back. She could be having some pain in her back as well. We'll be talking about some implications for pain and some things that we can do to help mothers with pain, too, as we move along. Where is a woman feeling pain during the second stage and delivery? So the second stage, remember, is from complete to pushing with the deliver, delivery of the baby. So where is she feeling pain during this time? If you look, again, uh, the, the range is much broader than the pain that was experienced during the first stage. Here we have intense contraction pain. It can even encompass her legs back pain, and then, of course, perineal pain as she begins to, to have the baby, especially during that crowning period. Uh, again, some patients can uh, say that they feel like a ring of fire, intense burning in that area as the baby is delivered. Pain management is needed for several reasons. Pain is coming from several sources. We have the dilation of the cervix with an abundance of nerve cells there, so that certainly can be painful. Hypoxia of the uterine muscle cells can lead to pain. Stretching of the lower uterine segment. Also, a, a critical piece here is anxiety and stress certainly can lead to the perception of pain. We'll be discussing some pain management techniques, both pharmacologic and non-pharmacologic. On the non-pharmacologic end, we can use a lot of relaxation techniques, comfort measures, dimming the room, music, massage, distraction, effleurage. What is effleurage? These are small, light finger movements in a circular motion on the abdomen. Helps kind of distract her and have her think of something else. Pattern paced breathing, where you tell her, breathe with me, and you really go through breathing like you would in a childbirth education class. Change of position is sometimes effective, the use of a birthing tub or a shower, as long as things are stable and this is okayed by the physician or midwife. On the pharmacological end of things, we can certainly use narcotics such as Stadol, Nubane, Demerol, or Morphine. What's the concern with the use of morphine in somebody who's laboring? The concern is that she may give birth to this baby and there could be respiratory compromise, just like what would happen in an adult. If she's imminently going to deliver, we would not give morphine, but occasionally, even when we think things look okay and we have some time for morphine, a baby may surprise us. So what is it that you want to have on hand? What is the antidote to morphine? The answer is Narcan. We would have this at the bedside in case the baby is born with respiratory compromise. Morphine is not well cleared. We can use an epidural, which is a local anesthetic and a narcotic that's placed into an epidural space, and I'll be describing this in the slides to come. Or we can use a spinal, which is a local anesthetic into the spinal fluid in the spinal canal. What are some nursing measures? What can you do to support your patient who's going through pain? Maybe they have an epidural. Maybe they're doing this all naturally. We can certainly offer massage or counter pressure. You might see people use tennis balls and kind of push into the back if somebody has a baby who's in a posterior position, and that can be quite painful. You may see massage to other areas or use of light touch. You can help them with some guided breathing. You can look at them if they are transitional and kind of, you know, have moments where they're having lack of control. You can say, look at me and breathe with me and really help them slow their breathing down. If they're comfortable with meditation, you can help them meditate or use a focal point. Sometimes people will bring in a picture of another child or something that they have at home that reminds them of something nice like a pet or their nursery for their baby. We can provide, if they're um, allowed and their, and their orders allow it, we can give them sips and chips. This means little sips of fluid and uh, chips of ice cubes. Typically, um, patients who are in labor aren't eating. There's always the possibility of something unforeseen happening and needing to go to surgery. So typically we don't have them with a full stomach, but we can give 
some sips and chips of fluid uh, for comfort. And then also hygiene. We want to make sure that their hygiene, is, that they're, you know, clean and that we're keeping them modest. Um, some patients may want, you know, to change their gown frequently or what have you. It can be a time where they can sweat um, or they might be getting wet and having fluids and some bleeding. So we do want to keep them clean and maintain hygiene during this time. So what are the pros and cons to epidurals? Certainly we have patients who walk in and even before we have them in the room, they're saying, I want my epidural. Others say, don't get that needle near me. The advantages of an epidural are that they allow the patient to be fully awake. And ideally, they, they don't have the severe pain, but they can feel the urge to push when it's time so they can be adjusted. Those are the advantages of them. Disadvantages, it is a skilled procedure, um, and it is, you know, just that. We do it under sterile technique and, and that kind of thing that can take up to 30 minutes uh, to place it and then for it to be effective. So sometimes if time is of the essence, um, that there in and of itself can be an issue. Where the epidural is placed in the back from there below, so below the waist, the patient has no control of movement. So we have to catheterize her every two hours to um, empty her bladder. We have to help reposition her. Um, and that can be kind of a, a very, very strange feeling to you know look at your legs and try to manipulate your body or hold your legs back as you're pushing without any control. A huge, huge issue here is hypotension, so a drop in blood pressure. One of the things that we'll do as nurses in preparing a patient prior to receiving an epidural and during the placement of an, of an epidural is a fluid bolus to try to bump up the fluids that she does have to um, hopefully uh, thwart off any possibility of hypotension. But if the mom's pressure bottoms out, baby also, if she has less pressure to perfuse the placenta, baby then will be affected. So we can see decreased variability or even a drop off in baby's heart rate. And that can be concerning because we don't want the fetus to go without oxygen related to this. So certainly we keep very, very close attention um, to the blood pressure readings. We will initially do them every two or three minutes for a period of time and then every 15 minutes for the duration of the time that she has the epidural. Another thing um, that's of concern for some patients who are self-pay is that epidurals can be costly. Like I said, it's a CRNA or, or um, anesthesiologist who puts it in. It is a skilled procedure, uh, the medication here. So it is costly, and that can be of um, importance to people, particularly who are self-pay. What are some of the things that can happen because of them? Now, these are rare. Um, seizures can happen meningitis because we have a catheter going, you know, straight into the um, cerebral spinal fluid. And um, again, very rare, there can be an arrest kind of situation. May also see patients who have a spinal headache. So some of the fluid that was cushioning the brain um, drains from, from this procedure, and now there's not as much cushion there. And the patient may complain of a spinal headache. What would a CRNA or anesthesiologist do for that once there's an evaluation and it's deemed to be a spinal headache? Um, they could do possibly a blood patch where they would take out some of the patient's blood and place it in there to replace some of the cushion. During placement of an epidural, a local anesthetic is placed into the epidural space. An anesthesiologist or certified registered nurse anesthetist would be doing this, and you may have the opportunity to see this in clinical, um, but we would not be performing this type of skill. It's important to note when we're helping patients through this um, that they'll often be having contractions through this. So we'll be helping them breathe through the contractions and help them in a supportive position. Many times they sit up on the edge of the bed and we'll kind of tell them to curve their back around their baby or assume the position of kind of a mad cat. They will um, cleanse the back with iodine and um, it is a sterile procedure. They will numb the area first and then go ahead and look for the spot and inject the anesthesia. What are the implications for a nurse who's caring for a patient with an epidural or who desires an epidural? The platelet count must be above 100,000 in order to have an epidural placed. In addition, we'll generally give a fluid bolus prior to an epidural. We'll monitor blood pressure frequently. Generally, it's every two to three minutes, 
at first, then every five minutes, then every 15 minutes we'll be getting a blood pressure for the duration of the time the patient has the epidural. Would you, ex would you expect an epidural to potentially increase or decrease blood pressure? The answer is potentially decrease. How would a drop in blood pressure affect the fetus? Well, if we have less pressure perfusing the placenta, we'd expect that the fetal heart rate may bottom out. We're concerned when this happens because we're concerned that the fetus would be getting less oxygen during this period of time. Part of the reason we give that fluid bolus is to help decrease the chance of blood pressure dropping significantly. Once an epidural is placed, we'll position a patient, generally on their left side, in a left lateral tilt to get pressure of the pregnancy off of the abdominal aorta so that blood flow can be maintained to the placenta. We'll frequently reposition them side to side because an epidural works through the use of gravity. So if they're on their left side too long, their left side may get very numb and their right side may not be very numb at all. So we'll kind of position them side to side to help balance out the epidural. Frequent repositioning also helps avoid pressure points. We'll monitor the effectiveness of the epidural to make sure she has good pain relief and we can call anesthesia back if she's not getting effective pain relief. In addition, since she won't be able to move from the waist down, she won't be able to have the ability to void independently either. So we'll be emptying her bladder and we'll do this approximately every two hours via straight catheter. There are several contraindications for epidurals or situations where a patient would not be able to get an epidural. A big one is the platelet count. If it's less than 100,000, um, definitely not a candidate for an epidural, and this kind of goes in line with having coagulation disorders or if the patient has hemorrhaged or we suspect that she's an impending hemorrhage because we don't want her to bleed from this site. Also, severe spinal abnormalities can make placement difficult, um, so these patients might not be eligible for an epidural. If the patient has uh, a huge infection or is septic, uh, we wouldn't want this to be a source for more infection or to spread the infection. And then of course, if a patient refuses an epidural or they're uncooperative, um, certainly we do need their cooperation to remain still during this. And if they're not able to do that, we may not be able to place an epidural. If the patient refuses, of course, that's their right. Uh, this is just one measure of pain relief, but they do not have to have an epidural. Uh, but these are some of the contraindications for epidurals. Another type of delivery is a cesarean birth. This is where the provider makes an incision along the abdomen through the uterus and delivers the fetus. More than one-third of the deliveries in our country, the United States, are via C-section. This is concerning and there's much controversy about this. There must be an indication for a C-section or a medical reason why a cesarean section is necessary. Some of these include a prior C-section, breech presentation, failure for labor to progress, fetal distress, and placental complications. Many of these issues will be discussed in the high-risk modules. You may see several types of cesarean section incisions. The most common is that of the low transverse abdominal incision. Some patients might call this the bikini line incision because it's low on the abdomen. This is most common in non-emergent situations. Patients prefer it, like I said, because the scar is low. However, it does take more time. So in emergent situations, we may see a classical or vertical incision. Also, the low transverse abdominal incision allows for a greater possibility of VBAC. VBAC stands for vaginal birth after cesarean. This is if they choose to have further pregnancies after this pregnancy. In addition, there's less risk of uterine rupture. This is where the uterus ruptures along a prior scar that was made in the uterus. In preparation for a cesarean section, the nurse would expect to do the following. Typically, we're going to do a shave prep, so we're going to shave any hair that they might have from about the umbilicus uh, down a little bit into the pubic hair area. In addition, we'll expect to start a Foley catheter so that we can record eyes and nose and drain her bladder during the procedure. 
will put SCDs on for DVT prevention. In addition, we'll prepare the patient for a spinal. Typically, patients will have spinal anesthesia for a cesarean section. If they were laboring and had an epidural, often they can really dose that up high and that can be quite effective. In emergency situations, they may have to do general anesthesia where they would intubate the patient and put her under. But for the most part, in non-emergent cesarean sections, we will be preparing the patient for spinal anesthesia. This is performed by a CRNA, Certified Registered Nurse Anesthetist, or an anesthesiologist. It's important to prepare and support the patient who will be having a cesarean birth, particularly if a patient didn't expect to be having a C-section. Maybe she came in and thought that she would be having a vaginal delivery. So we need to tell her what's going to happen, that they're going to be making an abdominal incision, she'll have a spinal for this, she should feel a pooling sensation but shouldn't feel pain, if it's non-emergent, patients are awake and are often allowed to have a support person with them. The baby will be delivered, will be in the same operating room as the mother is, and that there will be a team there to help the baby along. In addition, we need to tell her why this is going to be done. What indication was there? And tell her why this is going to be done. Also, some women may feel that they're to blame or that this is their fault that they're having a C-section. Maybe if the baby's in distress or she was pushing and there was failure to progress, we need to support her and tell her that she didn't do anything wrong here. Like I said, we'll give her examples of sensations that she may experience. In addition, we will support the coach or the father. In non-emergent situations, they often allow somebody to come into the room with her. So after we uh, get her her spinal, we would allow the father or coach to come in and sit right by the mother's head. And then they can go over to the isolate and see the baby and that kind of thing in the actual operating room. So it's important that we prepare her for all of this. Generally, a C-section delivery takes about an hour. The majority of that hour is spent with the repair. Following cesarean birth delivery, we'll encourage the mother to breastfeed. We'd still like to see her breastfeed within one hour, and generally this can take place in the recovery room. We want to continue to provide emotional support to the patient. This is particularly important if this was an urgent or emergent kind of C-section where it wasn't planned, and see how she's dealing with having a cesarean section. Orders that we'd expect, we would expect an order for Pitocin to make sure that her uterus remains nice and firm. Also DVT prevention. Typically we encourage patients to get up and ambulate about four hours after their surgery. In addition, SCDs are often placed. We'll expect an order to advance her diet and some pain management orders. The application of monitors can tell us a lot about what's going on as labor progresses. We can then interpret our findings, assess what's going on or what we believe is going on, and have some interventions that go along with those. Electronic fetal monitoring allows us to assess fetal well-being by looking at the baby's fetal heart rate patterns in conjunction with what's happening with the uterus. There are a couple of different ways that we can do this. Most commonly, you'll see an external fetal monitor. So this is in the diagram at the top. There's a machine, uh, typically with two wires that come out. One of them is placed on the maternal fundus, or the top of the uterus, that looks for uterine muscle tone. So this tells us if she's having a contraction. There's also a little external ultrasound guided device that can look for the baby's cardiac movement and can register a fetal heart rate tracing and we look at patterns in that which we'll be discussing. Another way of considering electronic fetal monitoring is through an internal fetal monitor. There is a scalp electrode uh, figure C that is placed as a small spiral scalp electrode that is kind of spiraled into the top layer of the skin on the fetal scalp. As far as uterine monitoring with an internal monitor, 
an IUPC would be placed, interuterine pressure catheter. And this is placed around the baby's head, and this gives us exact terms in milligrams of mercury contractions, the intensity of the uterine muscle tone and the intensity of the uterine contraction. So we can have external fetal monitors or internal fetal monitors, and on the coming slides we'll talk about the uses of each and the pros and cons of each. Now we're going to delve into external fetal monitoring a little bit more. So an external fetal monitor, like on the top diagram on the prior slide, we have monitors that are just that. They are placed externally on the mother's abdomen. So we have a toco looking for uterine muscle tone or contraction strength that's placed on the fundus, the top of the uterus. And we also have an external fetal monitor that's placed about over where we think the baby's heart would be. So it's looking for cardiac movement and then making a graphical representation of that. As we go on through the lectures, we will talk about what the normal should be for the fetal heart rate and interpretation of our findings related to that. So when would we use an external monitor? External monitors are great if things are going well. If we can get a good reading with an external monitor, it's nice because it's non-invasive. However, the uterine toco that we're looking at, what's telling us about uterine muscle tone, only tells us the duration of, con of the contraction. If it's on very tight or it's a very small woman, the contractions can look large. Contractions present themselves on fetal monitoring as hills, and they can look huge. So you think that she's booming out these huge contractions. You go in there, she's wearing her makeup, and she's smiling away. Well, probably not as intense as we thought. Likewise, you can have a woman who's very big, or maybe the monitor just isn't picking up her contractions, and she says that she's writhing in pain. She's having horrible contractions. And the toco really might not be indicating much going on at all. However, strength-wise, it can't tell us how intense they are. It can tell us how long they are lasting. So that's the duration of the contraction. We need to rely on the nurse and the patient to assess how intense a contraction is with an external monitor. A benefit, like I said, to both of these monitors is that they are non-invasive. However, the drawbacks are the inability to precisely determine how strong a contraction is based on what the monitor says. And on the fetal side, if the mother moves or the baby moves, we might not have an accurate reading. So the monitor may slip off. It may even see a maternal heartbeat and record that as fetal. And a maternal heartbeat rate would be very concerning if the baby's heart rate was what was normal for the mother. And we'll be talking about the normal heart rate later. So. With fetal movement, maternal size, application of monitor, and so on, there can certainly be some drawbacks here, but these are certainly the least invasive way to monitor uterine contractions and the fetal heart rate. Another form of electronic monitoring is internal monitoring. So here, monitors are placed internally via the vaginal area. An internal fetal monitor is a scalp electrode, a small spiral that's placed into the layer of skin on the baby's scalp so that we are sure, 100% positive, that this is the fetal heart rate. So that can give us reassurance if we're having difficulty uh, getting an accurate fetal heart rate on an external monitor. Also, we can look at interuterine pressure catheter to determine intensity of uterine contractions. This will give us specifics in milligrams of mercury what the muscle tone in the uterus is doing at resting tone in between contractions as well as during a contraction. So we can see how effective are contractions or is she hyperstimulated? Is there lack of stimulation to the uterine muscle during contractions? So when would we use these? We would use these when we're not getting a good reading with external monitoring. Because these are more invasive, there are some risks associated with them. What are they? Well, first of all, her bag of waters needs to be ruptured in order to use these because we need access to the uterine cavity for the IUPC, the interuterine pressure catheter, and we also need access to the baby's head. Um, so in addition to that, the baby must be in a vertex position head first in order to place this. Drawbacks include the risk for infection, 
because we're, you know, manipulating the area with the uterine, inner uterine pressure catheter, there's also a small risk for uterine perforation going through the uterus. So we'll monitor for infection um, and the possibility of uterine perforation. The baby may have a small mark on the scalp too, but typically um, they don't bleed severely or anything, but we are putting something in the scalp. Measuring contractions with an external monitor. Again, we have an external toco that's placed on the abdomen on the fundus. So if it's on tight or if it's a thin person, the peaks can look very, very large. If it's on somebody who's larger or it's not on very tight, they can look much smaller. So we'll be discussing how we can measure intensity on a slide to come. In this case, we're going to be measuring frequency and duration. What is the frequency? Frequency is how far apart they are, how frequently they are coming. You can measure this by going peak to peak. So if you consider that in between each of the red lines is one minute, within each of those there are six small boxes. Each of those is 10 seconds. So six small boxes, each being 10 seconds, is one minute. So you can measure these from peak to peak and determine how far apart contractions are. In this case, these contractions are occurring every two to three minutes. You can also measure them from the start of one contraction to the start of the next. Again, patients may call saying, oh, my contractions are, you know, two minutes apart. They are counting from one, when one ends to when the next begins. This is incorrect. In order to count the frequency of contractions, it's the start of one to the start of the next. So within that time period, you have a contraction and a full rest period to, to count frequency. The duration, how long do they last? That's from beginning to end, if you look at the middle graph there beginning to end. Knowing that each of these little boxes last 10 seconds, how long does this middle contraction last? I see 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, or 8 or 9 boxes. So about 80 seconds in duration. Frequency is how frequent they are. You can measure that from peak to peak or from the start of the contraction to the start of the next. That would include the contraction and the rest period. For duration, we're looking for how long it lasts from when you start to see the hill rise, if you look at the contraction as a hill, until when it's back to baseline. That is the duration. So we're measuring frequency and duration here. So how can we assess intensity of contractions with an external monitor? Well, the patient can report what's going on. Certainly, we need to take a cue from them. Like I said, if they're big hills, but she's sitting there with her makeup on, smiling, reading a magazine, chances are they're not strong plus three contractions. Might be wrong, but chances are probably not. One good way is through palpation. So we can palpate her fundus, the top of the uterus, while she's having a contraction. And some people call this the nose, chin, forehead test. A mild contraction feels kind of like pressing your nose. It's easily indented. A moderate contraction would be like the chin. It's a little bit more difficult to indent. And a strong contraction is like the forehead. It's hard. So we can palpate contractions and ask the patient about her contractions in order to measure intensity. With an internal monitor, an inner uterine pressure catheter, we can calculate in Montevideo units specifically how forceful a contraction is. Now this slide has a little bit more on it than you need to know, but what I want you to see here is that we can measure in milligrams of mercury specifically what the resting tone is. So we can see if somebody is hyperstimulated if they have, you know, a, a hyperstimulated labor pattern where they have too much pressure or if there's not enough going on, kind of a hypostimulation. So we have a baseline here of about 20 milligrams of mercury. So that's what's going on even when the uterus is at rest. There's about that much pressure. Then with the contractions, the size of the hill, in this case with an internal monitor on, does tell us how intense they are. So if, in this first one here, 
the size of the hill or the contraction goes up to 95. We subtract 20. We subtract the baseline from it to see how intense is just this contraction. Not including the baseline, but how intense is this contraction? And we get 75 milligrams of mercury. And the second contraction, again, it goes up to about 80. If you look at the graph, uh, the number corresponds to the number on the left. It goes up to about 80, but we have that baseline of 20, so we'll subtract it. So we have 60 for the strength of the second contraction. The third contraction, it goes up to about 70. So when we subtract 20 from that, its strength would be 50. So we're looking at the strength of just the contraction, not including the resting tone. So an inner uterine pressure catheter, what I want you to know about this is that you can tell intensity. Um, in order to tell it, you would subtract the baseline from the intensity, from the total uh, number. But as far as needing to know um, how many you need to have to be adequate and that kind of thing that's on this slide, don't worry about that aspect. But I do want you to see that this is a way that we qu can quantify, truly quantify, the strength of contractions. And we do this with an internal uterine pressure catheter. In order to interpret what an electronic fetal monitoring tracing is telling us, we need to know what's normal. First of all, what's the normal fetal heart rate? The normal baseline for a fetal heart rate is 110 to 160 beats per minute. So we kind of look at a trend over time and generally um, give it an increment rounded to, you know, 5 or 10. So for example, 125 or 130, 135 or 140. So what is the baseline? And this can slow with increased gestational age. For example, you might see um, a 20-week or a 20-week gestation pregnancy have a higher heartbeat. It might be in the, you know, 150s. And then it could slow to be in the 120s or 130s as the pregnancy continues on. So just like adults, babies can be tachycardic or can be uh, bradycardia. Tachycardia is a heart rate greater than 160, and this needs to last for more than 10 minutes. A bradycardia would be a heart rate less than 160, and that also needs to last for greater than 10 minutes. So a normal baseline for a fetal heart rate is 110 to 160. Here we have a graphical representation. What comes out of the monitor? You see there, um, one minute equals six of those small boxes. Each of the little boxes equals 10 seconds. So this is how we can time contractions, or if the baby's having an acceleration, an elevation in fetal heart rate, or a deceleration, a drop in fetal heart rate. So it's important to know how long these things are lasting. So you say, okay, well, what is the baseline fetal heart rate? At first glance, it kind of looks like it can go from anywhere from 120 or 118, and there are some spots where it's near 150, and I'm looking at the numbers over on the right to see that. So what's the baseline? That's kind of a range. What we're looking for is the in-between, where it is when it's a, a baseline, without any little drops in variability, that's what we call that jaggedness, or any elevations or accelerations. So on this piece of fetal monitoring strip, I'd be inclined to say that the baseline fetal heart rate is somewhere around 130 or 128. Like I said, generally we do it in terms of fives. So I'd be inclined to say that this is a baseline of 130. Here I have the same fetal monitoring example that I had in the fetal heart rate baseline slide. This time, though, we're looking at variability. Variability is that jaggedness of the fetal heart rate pattern. It doesn't just stay 130, 130, 130 as a straight line, and frankly, we'd be concerned if it did do that. We like to see some jaggedness there, the up-down. What does it mean when the fetal heart rate is going up a little bit? What does it mean when it's going down a little bit? This is the interaction between the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous systems. Do you remember? Does the sympathetic nervous system want the heart rate to go up or down? It wants the heart rate to go up. And what about the parasympathetic? Does it want the heart rate to go up or down? It's encouraging the heart rate to go down. So here, if you see that jaggedness, you show the push-pull between the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous systems. This is a good thing. We want the fetal nervous system to be intact. We want the central nervous system to be having a parasympathetic and 
and sympathetic nervous system fighting, if you will, against one another. This shows fetal well-being, and the jaggedness of this fetal heart rate pattern is called variability. We want there to be positive variability, indicating that there's an interaction between the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous systems. So we've discussed the presence of variability and how it indicates fetal well-being because there's a push-pull between the sympathetic, wanting the heart rate to go up, and the parasympathetic, wanting it to go down. Here, we don't really have very much variability. The heart rate, gosh, at the lowest, it looks like it's 118 or 119 and, you know, goes just above 120 in some places, but not real jagged compared to that other example in the prior slide. So it lacks that jaggedness, for lack of a better term. So this can be non-reassuring. Generally, though, we need to keep a couple of things into consideration. Has the mom just had pain meds? Certainly, if I, you know, give you or an adult morphine, you're going to feel a little, a little kind of sleepy, not quite as excitable. Same thing with the fetus as it's exposed to that medication. So if the mom is exposed to medications such as morphine or magnesium, magnesium will be addressing in the high-risk module. Also, babies have, you know, kind of sleep-wake cycles. Maybe the baby is just really in a deep sleep. But we'd expect this to go away if it lasted much more than about 40 minutes. If we um, want to see if the baby can kind of come out of this pattern, what are some things that we can do? What are some interventions? Well, what if I wanted to excite you? I could maybe give you something sugary and wake you up a little bit. Okay, well, for, for a fetus, how are we going to do that? We can give mom something to eat or drink that's sugary. So a sugary drink. Give it a few minutes, see if it wakes baby up. Another intervention would be an acoustical stimulator. You might hear in the clinical setting this being called a buzzer. And it's just that, it's painless, but it is a little apparatus that we put on the mom's abdomen. We push a button, it buzzes, and the purpose of it is to startle the baby. So just, you know, as if I were to slam the door or make some loud noise, it would startle you. We'd hope that your heart rate would pick up. Um, with the baby, we um, could also do that, see if variability picks up and see if there are any accelerations out of that. But um, if we're seeing a general kind of lack of variability, we would want to let the physician know. Another indication of fetal well-being are accelerations. Just like when you or I exercise, our heart rate goes up. We expect fetuses to do the same thing. We expect them to have elevations in heart rate with stimulation. What is a fetal heart rate acceleration? It's an elevation of greater than 15 beats per minute. It needs to last at least 15 seconds. And again, this indicates fetal well-being. So when we look at this fetal monitoring strip, the top strip indicates the fetal heart rate and its pattern. The bottom segment of the strip is uterine activity. So we're going to be looking at the top part, the part with the pink arrows going down. And the pink arrows are a major hint. Those are pointing to fetal heart rate accelerations. So first of all, whenever we get started looking at fetal heart rates, we need to find out what our baseline is. So what do you think the baseline is? Of course, there's a little bit of variability there, but what is one number that best sums it up when there are no accelerations and no decelerations? If I had to put a number on it, I would say 130. It is the line right above 120 where it appears to be um, kind of hanging out. So what are 15 beats above 130? 145. So we're going to kind of look at 145 and see if the heart rate ever reaches 145 or higher. And then the other part of the definition of an acceleration is that it needs to last at least 15 seconds. Now each of those small boxes are each worth 10 seconds. So an acceleration would need to last one and a half of those small boxes. So here where the pink arrows are, are indicating where the accelerations are in the fetal heartbeat. Again, presence of accelerations equals a happy baby. So how we, here we have a fetal monitoring strip we're going to evaluate. What do you think? Again, the first thing we're going to do is kind of look here and see what the baseline fetal heart rate is. And this fetal heart rate is kind of hanging out around the high 
20s, just about 130, maybe 128 to 132. So it's kind of flat. It kind of stays at the same number the whole time. Do you see any accelerations where the fetal heart rate goes 15 beats above that baseline of 130? Does it, does it go to 145? I'm not seeing that. And if it does, does it stay there for 15 seconds? No. So there is decreased variability and no accelerations. Is this reassuring or non-reassuring? Well, there aren't any decelerations. The heart rate doesn't drop at all. But this is still non-reassuring. So this is one of those times when you'd want to say, okay, take into consideration his baby um, been exposed to any medications via the mother? Could this be a sleep cycle for the baby? Can we use an acoustical stimulator to try to startle the baby and wake it up? Give mom something sugary? And we would be considering notifying the physician. So we've talked about accelerations and accelerations being reassuring. The opposite of an acceleration, a deceleration, a drop in the fetal heart rate. What do decelerations mean? Well, the answer is it depends on where it starts in relation to a contraction. Where does the drop in baseline start in relationship to the start of a contraction? And nursing interventions will depend on this. So we have a couple of things to interpret as we look at decelerations to determine what they mean and what we should do about it. Early decelerations are called early because they happen early in the contraction. So if you look at the top line there, the fetal heart rate, and the bottom line are the contractions. So here we have hills on the bottom indicating contractions. Let's see, the first contraction, we can count the number of boxes and see how long that lasts. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Uh, between 70 and 80 seconds long and right above that you can see as the contraction starts to go up from baseline resting tone as the uterus starts to contract the fetal heart rate starts to come down early decelerations often mirror the contraction they start to dip down from the baseline as the contraction does their peak is often at the strongest point of the contraction is the lowest point of the fetal heart rate and as the contraction starts to let up, the fetal heart rate goes back up to baseline. Why does this happen? This is due to head compression. So how concerned are we about this? Is it ever good that the fetal heart rate goes down? No, we want the fetus to have oxygen. However, do you expect that the head will be compressed during a vaginal delivery? We've talked about the delivery process you know, effacement, the cardinal movements, yes, the head will be compressed. As part of that head compression, there is a vasovagal response that will drop the heartbeat. So, we see this going on. What is your nursing intervention? It wasn't there in the past. All of a sudden, we look at the monitor and we see early decelerations. So you're thinking, okay, well now there's head compression. What are we going to do about it? Should we stop Pitocin if she's on Pitocin? Not necessarily. We need to get the baby out. I think the best intervention here is to check her. Per perhaps she is progressing and moving along. Maybe the baby is coming down further than where it was before. There's more head compression, so there's a change in uh, the status, and now we're seeing early decelerations. We could potentially change position, something like that, but essentially our main nursing intervention is going to be to provide a vaginal exam, see if um, she's had any change in her cervical status. Another type of deceleration or drop in fetal heart rate is a late deceleration. So again, when looking at decelerations, we consider where they happen in relation to the start of a contraction. As the name indicates, a late deceleration starts late within the contraction. So you'll see here where the pink arrows are on the fetal heart rate decelerations. The decelerations, if we consider that the baseline looks like it's at about 130, that would be in between decelerations, where is the fetal heart rate? That number seems to be hanging out around 130 beats per minute. The changes in fetal heart rate around then then are decelerations. 
So where do these decelerations start? Where is the onset of the deceleration? It is with the peak of the contraction. Then the fetal heart rate comes back up. Now don't confuse yourself. Don't, don't think that late decelerations happen after contractions. That's not true. They are happening starting with the peak of the contraction. So they start with the peak of the contraction and then resume the stated baseline, in this case of 130. And you can see with each contraction, this is happening. Why is this happening? Why is the, the, the baby's heart rate tolerating a contraction until the hardest point of the contraction? What is going on? These are due to uteroplacental insufficiency. So there is enough reserve within the uterus and placenta, within the uterus and placenta, for the contraction until it gets to that really tight moment, until it gets to the peak of the contraction. Then there's no reserve left. The baby compensates by dropping its heartbeat, and so you can see that here. These are non-reassuring. Repetitive late decelerations are non-reassuring. Some further explanation about late decelerations. So we know that they're due to utero-placental insufficiency. The fetal heart rate starts to bottom out at the peak of the contraction because there's enough reserve in the placenta during the contraction until it really gets hard, until the contraction is really at its peak. So this is a sign of stress and hypoxia. We're concerned during this time particularly about what organ? About the brain. That's the organ that we're always most concerned about with these fetuses. So we have some nursing interventions here. I like to call them the five turns. It's an easy way to kind of remember it. If the mom is on Pitocin to stimulate contractions, we're going to turn that off. So we're going to turn the damage off. It's the contractions that are causing the late decelerations that the baby isn't tolerating. So first, we're going to put out the fire, turn the Pitocin off. We can turn the oxygen on. What would I do in any case for an adult or anybody else? who had a low heart rate. Well, we'd give them some oxygen. We'd turn some fluids on. So we're going to do those things for the patient, in this case the fetus. We're going to turn O2 on for the mom so that the hemoglobin, her hemoglobin carries oxygen and that is transported through uh, the placenta so that the blood the baby is getting is high in oxygen. We're going to turn fluids on to give a, some boost of fluid volume here. We're going to turn the mom to her left side. Why the left side? Well, hopefully, if we turn her onto her left side, we're going to get pressure off of the abdominal aorta, and that feeds into the uterus and allows the placenta to get more blood flow. Sometimes some people have a little bit different anatomy. Every now and then you'll see a woman where she does better on her right, but for the most part, it's the left side so that we can increase perfusion to the placenta. And then the fifth turn is to call, turn the call light on. In reality, these things are going to be happening simultaneously. But um, kind of thinking about the nursing interventions for late decelerations, what do you do? The five turns. Turn the Pitocin off to stop the harm. Turn oxygen on. Turn fluids on. Turn the patient to her left side, being the mom in this case, and turn the call light on. Late decelerations are a sign of uteroplacental insufficiency and are non-reassuring. If they are repetitive and we can't seem to stop things, yet uh, labor can't progress without them going on, this may be an indication for cesarean section. You may also see variable decelerations. Don't confuse the word variable deceleration with variability. They are two different things. Variability is the jaggedness of the fetal heart rate baseline showing the push-pull between the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. A variable deceleration is just that. It is a deceleration. Remember, we consider decelerations in their relation to when they start with a contraction. A variable, when do you think it starts? It's variable. It depends. It can be before a contraction, after it, during it, in between. It is variable in timing, hence the word variable deceleration. What is kind of the cornerstone to a variable? It's its abruptness. It abruptly goes down from the baseline and then abruptly returns to baseline. They are often V or W shaped. Abruptly goes down from the baseline, abruptly comes back up. 
For a little bit further explanation of variable decelerations, you can see them here in conjunction with the fetal monitoring strip with the contractions. In this case, it looks like the patient is pushing with those contractions. You're not expected to, to know that, but if you're wondering why they're divided, that's what's happening. She's pushing about three times per contraction. Do you see that jaggedness, the way that deceleration kind of looks like a V? It quickly comes down, almost a straight line, and quickly comes back up. That's how we know that it's a variable deceleration. It's not just kind of uniformly kind of going down and then coming back up kind of bowl-shaped. It's much spikier, much more abrupt. What is this due to? This is due to cord compression. It can be a cord around the neck. It can be a cord under the body, and with a contraction, the baby is pushing on it. It can be a cord wrapped around the limb of the baby. There's some cord compression going on here where when the blood flow is compromised, the fetal heart rate quickly goes back down, and when blood flow is open and free to move again, the fetal heart rate quickly returns back up to baseline. That's why you see that abruptness. It's due to cord compression. The lack of blood flow in the cord makes it go down. When blood flow is available again, quickly comes back up. Nursing interventions, what can we do? Sometimes it's positional. If we can find what position it is, if the kid is on the cord, we can move so that there's not as much pressure on the cord. Sometimes we can do that. Are we going to turn Pitocin off? Mm, probably not. She still needs to progress with this. So we can change positions. Wouldn't hurt to give her some O2 or fluids. But with these, we'll continue to monitor. We could let the doc know. But generally, this is cord compression. Um, as an aside, about 23% of babies are born with a cord around the neck. Not all of them obviously have horrible outcomes, but that is um, something that we see quite, quite frequently. And we would expect a baby with a cord around the neck to have a fetal monitoring strip that has quite a few variable decelerations in it. To kind of sum up and compare and contrast the three types of decelerations, this slide is kind of helpful so that you can see it all in one place. I'll start with the early decelerations since they are on the first column and we covered them in this order. The early decelerations, again, if you remember, are due to head compression and the vasovagal response. We expect to see head compression with a vaginal delivery. They are uniform in shape and they mirror the contraction. They have an early onset. They happen early in the contraction, hence the name early deceleration. Um, they are consistently low at or before the midpoint of the contraction as far as where their lowest level is. And they can be single or they can be repetitive in nature. So we can just see one early or we can see kind of a, a chronic pattern of early decelerations. Late decelerations. Why are these happening? These are happening due to uteroplacental insufficiency. These ones are very concerning. They have the name late deceleration because they happen when? They have been late in the contraction. These also have a uniform type of shape. The lowest point is typically after the midpoint of the contraction. They can be occasional, they can be consistent, or they can be repetitive in nature. And finally, a variable deceleration. This is due to cord compression. It can be, again, a cord around the limbs, like in this picture. It can be a cord around the neck. It is variable in its shape. Again, abruptness is what's key here. They are not uniform in shape. They can look V, W, very spiky. Generally, sharp drops with sharp returns. This is um, an abrupt onset with a fetal insult not related to a contraction. The variable is around the midpoint. And these can also be single or repetitive. So this slide is kind of nice because you can see all three decelerations and how they compare to each other. Again, their names are in relationship with when they happen with the contraction. The most concerning one of these is the late deceleration. This is a prolonged deceleration. A prolonged deceleration is a deceleration that, that drops greater than or equal to 15 beats, beats below the baseline, and it lasts longer than two minutes, but less than 10. So typically longer than an early deceleration, a late deceleration, or a variable. A prolonged deceleration, can happen with the contraction or independent of it. In this case, 
independent of a contraction. You see a little bit of markings here on the uh, TOCO, but no contractions happening here. So the duration is longer than two minutes, but less than 10, and then there's a recovery. Also looking at this strip, you see some decrease in variability, and during this time, I don't see any accelerations. Um, these are concerning. Prolonged decelerations are concerning. You definitely want to let somebody know. Um, put some oxygen on her. It wouldn't hurt to turn off the Pitocin and kind of go through the five turns, but we need to be letting somebody know if she's having prolonged decelerations. These are non-reassuring. There are a couple of indirect methods of fetal assessment. One of these is scalp stimulation. If the woman's water is broken and she's laboring, and we're, we have a questionable strip, maybe there aren't great accelerations, we can stimulate the baby by rubbing its scalp. So kind of like a digital exam, we would go in there and kind of tickle the baby's head with our fingers and see if this evokes an acceleration kind of like the acoustic stimulator that I talked about earlier trying to evoke an acceleration. We can also do a cord blood analysis at birth. With this, we would be considering blood gases and pH. Um, many providers think that this is uh, very useful if the baby's APGAR score is below 7, even at 5 minutes of life, and you'll be able to know what the APGAR score means when we get to the uh, newborn lecture. But a cord blood analysis can tell us if the baby has gone through acidemia. This concludes the labor and delivery lecture. If you have any questions or concerns, please feel free to let me know.